Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what I love? Stories. Stories in any format. Written, verbal, theatrical. All genres of stories as well. Action, mystery, comedies, romance, cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers, fiction, nonfiction, literally every kind of story. I love stories so much that often my favorite part of a story is when they tell a story inside that story. I've shared my love of stories with my family as well. And I know TV rots your brain and all, but one of our traditions is to gather together to watch a new TV show or a new movie for the first time together. We'll even wait for each other so that no one misses out. What we like to do this for is that we can talk about the story together. We often share what we like or we dislike about the story. We will talk about what the plot is, whether or not they are being consistent within the story. Uh, the consistency of a story is huge between a movie or a series of movies, and especially big for a TV show. We wonder if they completed the whole story. Did they tie up all the loose ends? What is the director trying to stay with the way they shot the story? Everything we talk about. Some of the best stories end up hitting you in the face with realizations. They all dangle a carrot in front of you that you don't realize, or you do think you realize, what is happening, and then whack! They change something. Something is revealed that changes the story and your understanding of it completely. The best stories, you never see this coming. This happens in my favorite story multiple times. It's an old story and one I'm sure you've all heard. Some parts are told in different ways or from different points of view. But the, the meaning of the story is always the same. And it always comes to the same ridiculously surprising way. I don't think I could pick a favorite part of the story. But one of my favorite parts is where there's a change in how we see the hero. It's almost an origin story. It's not an origin story. But it's such a drastic change in the way we see the hero that it's just as important or just as vital as the way the story of a hero begins. This part begins with the introduction of a really solid character. He's not in the story that often, but we quickly like him and understand why he's important. He's a grown man, maybe in his 30s, and he's just. He's a good guy. He's not weak. He's not vindictive. He's not irrational. We start by actually feeling sorry for him because we think he kind of gets a, a raw deal. He's facing a situation that many of us would react differently in. The story takes place a long time ago and in a very different society and culture from ours. He's married to a young woman, but they're yet to consummate this marriage. So they call it a betrothal, but in all actuality, it's a legal marriage. One of the reasons they do this is to be sure that the woman hasn't been unfaithful. They do it for a period of time so that way any child that comes from this marriage can be certain that it is from the husband. So, when we see the reaction of this just man finding out that his wife is pregnant, we're a little surprised, but we respect him and like him for it. He doesn't react the way we see most people react in stories. He doesn't swear vengeance for his honor. He doesn't sit in the corner and cry, woe is me, which is different. He doesn't actually act in any vindictive way at all, which is very different and very good. As the audience, we already have some insights to the child that the mother carries. We already know that there, there isn't another man. She has not been unfaithful. There's no earthly father. The child has a supernatural beginning that the just man is not aware of yet. Which is really good, because the young woman is also somebody that we root for, and somebody that we see and respect. She's not the villain of the story. So the just man, knowing that at some point people are going to start to wonder how his wife became pregnant when they're not living together yet, decides to divorce her quietly. 
I think it's safe to speculate that the just man hopes that his wife will marry the other man, the other guy, in, in enough time to save some face in a society that looks at marriage in a very different way than we do. His grace and his forgiveness is endearing. The character that does the right thing is, is often refreshing to us, and it's always endearing. This is the kind of character that we often wish we could be ourselves. But that's not the path the story takes. We get one of our, my favorite scenarios in storytelling, that story within a story with metaphorical chin music. The just man is thinking and deciding whether or not to, to divorce his wife, and he decides to sleep on it. But in his slumber, he is visited by an angel. An angel, a messenger of God. One of the guys in the story that smout and destroys the enemies of God. So the plot thickens for the just man. The angel says to him, Do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Not in so many words, he's saying, Don't worry about what people are going to say about her. Don't worry about how people are going to mock you and what they're going to say about the child you will raise. Because this child is not like other children. So, there's more. And this time, it's the story within a story, which is a flashback. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. This just man knows exactly what that means. But the angel still isn't done. He says one more thing. You shall call his name Jesus. This boy, this son, is the Messiah, whose story has been foretold so many times and in so many ways. You see, many people thought that this flashback from Isaiah was actually done. This prophecy was completed when Isaiah's wife had a child. And over that period of time when the child is being born, the rest of Isaiah's prophecies come to fruition about the king of Israel, about Israel itself, and about all the superpowered kingdoms around them. They all happen. So they think that the prophecy is fulfilled. And so it is. And so it is not. The prophecy was so much more than those moments. It was about this moment, this exact moment when Jesus is foretold. The moment when God begins the end. When the story's true meaning starts to be revealed in an undeniable way. But most of what I've been talking about is actually surface stuff. Any reader or hearer of this text can see in a clear way what's happening. They can even look at this flashback and understand it on its surface. But there's more. There's more going on. We get to hear about this just man and his small part to play, but he isn't the point of the story. What more can we see? Where is the continuity from in this part of the story from with the, the rest of the story that's been told over the past thousands of years? At this point, the story opens up, and we can easily find ourselves lost in the rabbit trails that we go down. I'm going to try to keep us a little bit on track. To start with, virgins don't have children. It's because they're still virgins. But the seed of a woman was promised to our first parents, not the seed of a man. This seed, who is the coming Messiah, would be born of a woman, and he would be himself a man. It was promised that he would be the son of David, the rightful king of Israel. But he is also promised to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Messiah is not only a man, he is also God. But this man was also to be named Jesus, meaning God saves, which is the exact task that the Messiah is coming to fulfill, to save his people. So Jesus, conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, was the only man to live a perfect life, without sin. His life was perfect, but not the life around him. He was born into a world full of sin, but he was perfect. And his perfect sinless life 
shows us why he is worthy of all praise and honor and why he is the only worthy sacrifice. He suffers under Pontius Pilate. He's crucified. He dies and he's buried. All of it to atone for the sins of the entire world. But he descends into hell to announce his victory. And on the third day he rises from the grave ensuring that all who believe in him will also rise on the last day. He ascends into heaven and he sits on his throne, the throne of God, where he will rule forever until he returns and he calls all of his people home, where they will be with him forever, forever in the presence of God. It's a little strange for us. The way our minds work, when we know a story, when we hear the end of the story, when we read or we watch a good mystery, we have a moment of excitement at the end of it. When the end reveals everything that it was building up to, and all of the blocks start to fall into, into place. We see the outcome, we recognize the blocks, and the joy happens. But once we know it, we lose a little bit of excitement for the end of that story, because we know what has happened. But that's not the case with Scripture. Every book of the Bible reveals a little bit more about Jesus. And eventually, we do hear the end. We know the outcome of everything. We see how some of the blocks fall into place, but it doesn't end there. There are more blocks that we do not understand and that we, do, that we miss. There are always parts of the story that are opened up to us to reveal more, no matter how well we think we know other blocks. Even though we know the end of this story, we know that Jesus has come and what he has done, his death, his life, and his resurrection, the story's not over yet. The end hasn't happened, and we are waiting. So we wait in excitement. We wait for it to take place, the joy that will take place at the end. And as we wait, we pray, come Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Now may the peace of our Lord, which surpasses all understanding, guard and protect you in Christ Jesus. Amen.